My name is Jonathan Lee, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be with you all here today to give this talk on mental health and illness from a Christian psychiatrist's perspective. Um, just so that we're all on the same page, a psychiatrist is someone who has gone through medical training and is trained to assess and to treat mental illness with both medications and also with psychotherapy. And a psychologist is someone who's gone through a dedicated graduate program and is trained to assess and to treat mental illness with psychotherapy. So we'll start out with a couple of disclaimers. Um, I am unabashedly Christian and I am unabashedly a psychiatrist and so I will be approaching this topic with that bias in mind that these two seemingly opposing perspectives can be held in tension with one another. Uh, I will also only be able to begin to scratch the surface in the time that we'll have together. I'm gonna try to keep it really brief so that we have lots of time to interact at the end. Is it feeding back there? <laughs> it sounds like it's feeding. In any case, I'm gonna um, just highlight some objectives that we'll cover over the time that we have together. I'd like to highlight some apparent controversies between psychology and psychiatry, and as well as Christianity. I'd like to discuss how the brain and the body may interact to give rise to psychiatric symptoms, and also review some key biblical passages which I think will help inform our understanding about suffering. And finally, I'd like to end off with some practical ways to engage brothers and sisters in our midst who are suffering. I think it's really important for us when we talk about a topic like mental illness to remember that mental illness is not just some theoretical abstract concept out there, but that it affects people, people that we love, our brothers and sisters, people in our families, in our churches. And so I thought it would be important for us to start out with a few vignettes. Uh, these are loosely based on people that I've encountered in the past, uh, but they're not based on any one specific individuals, just to keep our discussion kind of grounded. Uh, so we'll start out with Chris. Chris is a 19-year-old second-year psychology student at the University of Toronto, and he's uh, really a great student. He was very bright coming into university, but over the past couple of months, he's really had difficulty getting up out of bed uh, and really having difficulty focusing and concentrating on his schoolwork. Uh, he, he's actually been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, and so over the past little while, he's had trouble uh, feeling blue and down depressed all the time. He no longer experiences joy, and life is just a gray, morass for him. It's gotten so bad that over the past couple of weeks he's even contemplated what it would be like, you know, if he went to sleep and he didn't wake up again. Um, his psychiatrist has actually suggested a trial of antidepressants, uh, but from where Chris comes from, you know, the idea of starting medication seems like a failure or a cop-out. It's not really dealing with the true heart issues, and so Chris is feeling like he's caught between a rock and a hard place. Teresa is a middle-aged woman in your small group, and she's just come to the end of a very rocky and dramatic divorce after decades of a relationship with an emotionally and physically abusive husband. And she struggles with really uncontrollable anxiety. She worries so much about her future, about her mental health, about the health of her children, her finances, and the whole wake and the aftermath of her divorce. And, you know, she's really feeling the anxiety all day long. She feels fatigued by it. When you're talking with her, her mind seems to go blank because her mind is flitting to the next worry to think about. She feels it in her back, in her shoulders, all over her body, really. And many well-meaning brothers and sisters have said to her, you know, we're praying alongside you. Uh, we're here for you. They've quoted scripture to her, cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. Uh, do not be anxious in anything but in everything by prayer and supplication. Present your requests before God. And at varying times, these can be helpful for Teresa, and at other times, uh, it feels somewhat alienating for her. And finally, Candace is a 14-year-old young woman who you know really well. She uh, and her whole family attend your church. She attends the youth group, which you lead. Um, and you've noticed that over the past few months, something's a bit off about Candace. She seems a bit spacey, and she seems to startle and frighten really easily. Uh, and one night, she actually comes to you in tears and says that she's actually been sexually molested by her uncle over the past three months. She can't get to sleep. She has nightmares all the time, it's as though she's back in those instances when she was with her uncle whenever she sees a middle-aged Caucasian male. And she really has a tough go of things. Her mental anguish is really, really acute. What do we do in these situations? How do we show love and compassion and point people to Christ in these instances of suffering? 
Well, maybe we'll start out with a few controversies. Uh, to begin with, many of you will know this individual, Sigmund Freud. He's the father of modern psychoanalysis. He was a trenchant atheist. Uh, he's been quoted as saying, there's only ever been one Christian, and he died on the cross, and also that religion is society's grand childhood neuroses, reflecting its longing for a father. And perhaps less hostile than her father, Anna Freud, uh, a notable psychoanalyst in her own right, uh, developed a lot of theories about defense mechanisms has been quoted as saying, uh, well, you know, I was always looking for strength outside of myself, but I realized it was within me. It was there all along. And Carl Rogers, another notable humanistic uh, psychologist, has said uh, in the past, it's, it's the direction, it's not the destination. And I'm not perfect, but I'm enough. So perhaps understandably, I, th I think many people within the church would have a certain suspicion or skepticism about some of these secular psychological theories that seem really interlaced with humanistic philosophy. Some, like a uh, well-known preacher and homeschooling advocate, Vody Bauckham down south, uh, have been quoted as saying, most Christians don't know that there's no such thing as chemical imbalance. Psychology and psychiatry have never cured anyone of anything. And can you imagine trying to get truth and the gospel through to an individual who is on a cocktail, a fistful of powerful psychotropic drugs, has a flat affect and stares off into the space when you talk to him? Do you think that makes it easier or more difficult for a person to hear and heed and comprehend the gospel? And I'm sure this individual needs no introduction. John MacArthur has been quoted as saying, the stampede to embrace the doctrines of secular psychology may be the most serious threat to the life of the church today. These doctrines are a mass of human ideas that Satan has placed in the church as though they were powerful, life-changing truths from God. And years ago on their website, the Biblical Counseling Foundation has said, and I quote, the word of God has been given to man as the sole source of finding God's solutions to the real problems that plague him. And many people in these camps will turn to verses uh, to substantiate their thoughts, verses like Deuteronomy 4.2, which says, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And so they'll use these texts as proof texts to say, see, there you have it. The Bible is the sole source of everything that we need to know about everything. But the logic of that actually falls short if we consider this verse in context. Uh, as we know, after Moses wrote the Pentateuch, there are several other writers who then added to the canonical scriptures. And so even using this text, we can't actually stretch it to say more than what it actually uh, does. And people will also look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 and say the same kind of thing. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So here people will turn to this verse and say again, scripture is adequate, it's inerrant, it's all sufficient, and that's what it is. But what they fail to realize is that the adjective here, adequate, refers to the man of God, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I, I don't challenge the inerrancy of scripture at all, and I'm not saying that psychology and psychiatry are on par uh, with scripture at all. What I am saying is that we should be careful not to take scripture and extend it to say something that it does not. In fact, scripture itself seems to point to extra-biblical sources of wisdom. And Greg Kokel from uh, School of Rosemead, School of Psychology in Rosemead, California, so uh, it's, a, it's a Christian integrative program um, has pointed to Proverbs uh, to make this argument. So if you look in Proverbs 6, the wise sage says to his son, go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. And so here it's, it's almost saying, use your powers of observation, use your conscious judgment and look at nature, observe these patterns, these phenomena that happen. If you're a lazy, if you're a lazy sluggard, you know, like a door that turns on its hinges, there's gonna be certain consequences. But if you're diligent like this ant, there are gonna be certain consequences uh, as well. And so he's suggesting that maybe if we look outside the Bible, we can actually use our powers of observation as well to draw inferences about the world around us. And I'm really grateful for individuals like David Paulison and Ed Welch of CCEF. Uh, these are individuals who I believe present a very balanced view on this topic. And they suggest that it's not an either or kind of thing, but really a both and, that we can use wisdom and discernment uh, and really think about incorporating 
medical interventions to help alleviate suffering for those who are experiencing it within the church. Um, and so just to give you guys an example to flesh this idea out, uh, how many of us have felt more irritable than we normally would if we've missed a night of sleep or we've missed a meal? Can I get a show of... Show of hands, right. So in these instances, brothers and sisters, how reasonable would it be for us to say, you know what, I'm just gonna pray harder. I'm just gonna read more of, of the scriptures. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna help. Well, I mean, maybe that would work, but to me, it makes a lot more sense to say, hey, you know what, brother, here's a burrito. Why don't you have that? Why don't you have a nap in my hammock out back, and then we'll talk about, you know, that irritability. So maybe in, the same, in a similar vein, uh, there may be something to this idea of a chemical imbalance. Uh, if somebody has, you know, a biochemical deficiency of catecholamines in their brain, and God has given us common grace through the means of medications that can address those deficiencies, maybe we can encourage our brothers and sisters and not bind them from using these means of grace that could ultimately enable them to then go on and benefit from and make use of wise biblical counsel, pastoral ministry, and the love and prayers of the saints as well. So hopefully, I'm just beginning to scratch the surface, and I'm hopefully generating a lot of questions in your minds that will, uh, will, will seed some questions for the question and answer period. So I'd like to spend some time just introducing the biopsychosocial spiritual model of mental illness. And so this is actually a concept that I learned in my secular psychiatric training, uh, and it's an approach that we use to thinking about the different factors that weigh in uh, what causes mental illness, basically. And so we'll go through each of these. So here we have a beautiful uh, neuron. It's a work of art created by God. As you can see, there's a neuronal cell body. And from it, uh, there extend several dendritic branches that emerge in a fractal pattern. And each of these branches uh, are connected at varying points to other neurons of like variety. And within the brain, you can have several layers of, of cells within the cerebellum and within the cerebral cortex, which is the outer bark-like area of the brain that you see when you peel back the skull. Um, there's actually six layers of cells um, that are all interconnected. And the number of connections between neurons, the number of connections between neurons, again, can we advance the next slide, um, is actually said to outnumber the stars in the night sky. And so I think it's true that we can say that we are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. But what we know from the biblical account of creation is that when Adam and Eve fell, when they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, sin entered in, and then all of creation was to some extent marred or broken. And so uh, not only were our individual bodies, minds, and spirits uh, changed irrevocably by sin, but also our relationships with each other and society at large. So I think in these instances, we need to think think about multiple different determined um, factors that might contribute to mental illness. So we're going to go through biopsychosocial um, spiritual factors. So first, biology. Uh, we all know the story, uh, you know, a couple falls in love and they have a child and the child is wonderful and perfect and everything. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, these parents will have, can we back up? to the parents, yeah, these parents each have genetic lineages of their own, right? So uh, parents will come with different genetic probabilities or predispositions. Maybe mom has three generations of individuals affected by major depressive disorder. Maybe dad has a family history of generalized anxiety disorder. And what we know uh, from the research literature is that people who come from families where there are known uh, mental illnesses are more likely to experience that same mental illness. And the heritability or the predict pred predictiveness of uh, her family heritage um, is, it varies with mental disorders. So things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are highly, highly heritable, uh, whereas depression and anxiety are, are less so. And that suggests in those instances there may be other factors at play beyond just the genes. There, there are always other factors at play is what I'm going to hopefully conclude with, but just to, to beg a point. So again, we're not going to be able to open up all of the research literature, but just to have a few uh, thoughts. Glenda McQueen is a clinician psychiatrist uh, clinician psych scientist, I'm sorry, out west, uh, and she's done a lot of uh, work looking at neuroimaging, and she's imaged uh, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is this part of the brain uh, that is seahorse-shaped. Um, can we advance to the next slide, please? 
uh, that is seahorse shaped, um, and it's thought to be involved in encoding and memory. Uh, and she's looked at the brain, uh, the hippocampus of individuals who are healthy and individuals who have uh, depression. And so on the left, you can see a typical fMRI image of someone who's healthy, and you can see the hippocampus lit up in red. It's nice and large and juicy, uh, and so this is a healthy sort of hippocampus. And on the right, you can see the hippocampus of an individual who has had recurrent episodes of major depressive disorder. And so you can see it's a different size. So here it begs the question, maybe, you know, there's something going on in the brain, in the actual brain of the person who is experiencing this mental illness. Maybe it's not, you know, quote unquote, all in their head. Um, and so this goes along with different theories, uh, like the neuroinflammation hypothesis. Can we go back again? Uh, the neuroinflammation hypothesis um, that would suggest that when we're experiencing depression, there's actually an inflammatory process that's going on in the brain, and it's actually changing the structure of the brain that we see. Incidentally, if you look at the research literature, and we don't do this in general hospitals because we just don't have the resources to do this, but if we look at the research literature, people who are followed in this way, who have their brains imaged over time, um, actually show a recovery of these brain structures when they are treated with things like psychotherapy and also with medication. So there's actual structural brain changes that occur not only with medication, but with um, adequate and effective psychotherapy. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, an image of the amygdala that's lit up. The amygdala is a part of the brain that is thought to play a role in fear conditioning uh, or fear circuitry. And uh, this study looked at the size of childhood amygdala uh, and future onset of uh, anxiety disorders. And they found that children who had larger, on average, amygdala uh, actually went on to have higher rates of anxiety disorder uh, down the line. So again, this is kind of interesting biology, underlying, psychological, mental illness symptoms. Finally, we're going to come to this uh, PTSD slide. Um, and so here, a similar study looking at the neurosecuritry of fear. Uh, remember in PTSD, so Candice, you know, having these recurrent flashbacks, these uh, really difficult times, this panic, um, it's almost as though she's replaying the memory over and over and over again. We know the brain is highly plastic, and when we seem to have these memories go on again, we seem to strengthen these connections within the brain. And so what this study showed was that the stronger the connectivity of the amygdala with different parts of the brain, uh, the, the stronger the PTSD symptoms. And in theory, you could ameliorate these with adequate therapy and medication as well. What about the psychological contributions to mental illness? Um, I mean, obviously, legitimately so, there are probably some skepti there's skepticism about humanistic philosophies and contributions, but I just want to bring up one individual, Aaron Beck. Uh, he was trained, I believe, as a psychoanalyst, but he actually developed a branch of psychotherapy called Cognitive Behavior Therapy, or CBT for short. Uh, cognitive for thoughts and behavior for behavior, therapy for therapy, uh, and we're not going to become CBT therapists at the end of the session, but uh, just to distill it down to a very simplistic uh, distillation, uh, he posited that our thoughts and our behavior and our moods were in interconnected. So if you were feeling depressed, let's say, you might withdraw from your friends and hole up in your room, and you might tell yourself, nobody really likes me and I don't have any friends. Uh, and so he focused in on the thoughts of these people who were depressed, and he noticed that there were certain characteristic cognitive distortions that would color their view of the world. Um, and he, he highlighted these, these types of thoughts as the depressive triad. So the depressive triad would be negativistic or depressogenic thoughts about the self, about the world, and about the future. So depressed people tend to think about themselves, I'm a terrible person, I'm ultimately rejectable, uh, and about the world, nobody really cares about me, and people just care about themselves, and about the future, nothing's going to change, no amount of treatment is going to really help me, I'm going to be depressed forever. And um, I guess I want to pause there and just say that here we have a model, uh, potentially, of what might be giving rise to mental illness, and it doesn't actually seem to be dissonant with what the Bible would have to say in and of itself. Certainly in Romans 12, 2, it seems to suggest something similar. Now, I recognize this is kind of out of context, but bear with me for a second. It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So here, the Bible itself seems to suggest that there is a certain degree of change that is possible, or transformation that is possible by the renewing of our minds. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, 
Jones, another famous preacher, uh, has been quoted as saying, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? So here he's almost saying, you know, preach to yourself, like tell yourself the truth, change the way that you think. And this kind of process is encapsulated in Psalm 42 as well. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Uh, the psalmist is saying to himself, hope in God, um, and almost directing his thoughts Godward. And so I, I guess I bring this up as an example just to say that within the church we can't actually... I think we should refrain from wholesale rejecting, you know, psychological theory as a whole kind of thing and throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater. There may actually be theories that, that ultimately inform uh, how we heal and are actually consonant with what the Bible would have to say. Um, and I, I don't think we need to get into the habit of binding our brothers and sisters and say, being truly puritanical in the name of, uh, you know, conservatism or whatever it is, um, and say, you know, you can't handle, you can't be exploring these additional uh, modes of intervention that can bring healing and alleviate our suffering. What about the social factors uh, that influence mental illness? Uh, well, if you recall, Teresa was in this relationship with an abusive husband who was angry, controlling, he was an alcoholic throughout her pregnancy. Uh, he was physically and emotionally abusive to her to the point where she had to several times uh, leave the, the family home and, and live to some extent in, in poverty uh, with her children. Uh, so you can imagine if you're faced with these, these real stressors uh, and these forms of suffering, it's gonna be more likely that you're going to have you know, depressive-like symptoms or anxiety-like symptoms. And it actually goes a, a layer deeper than that. In fact, your exposure to stressful events can actually interact with your very genes. There's a branch of genetics called epigenetics, uh, where in which you, know, if you, you can have exactly the same genotype, but one person, one twin, let's say, is exposed to physical and sexual abuse, and it turns on certain genes through methylation and histone modification um, leading to ultimately depressive episodes or a bout of anxiety, and the other twin is adopted into a stable family and, and goes on and lives their, their merry life. And so it's actually a really complicated kind of thing when we're dealing with mental illness. We need to be considering multiple, multiple different factors at once. Finally, let's talk about the spiritual uh, kind of side of things. Uh, secular psychiatry would certainly not bring up this word, uh, but I think it may be on everyone's minds. Uh, how much does sin relate to mental illness? Um, and I think, you know, if, if you look at Psalm 32, there is at least one instance where I uh, hear David is talking about sin and relating it to his own mental anguish. We don't know if this was written after he sinned with, uh, with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, but he says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up. So here, I mean, it, it, was he experiencing a depress depressive episode? I don't think I can say that per se, but he seems to highlight some symptoms that, that would cohere with that kind of labeling. And he goes on to acknowledge his sin before God, and God ultimately forgives him. But can we say that all mental illness is somehow related to or a direct consequence of our personal sin? I don't think we can say that. And Ed Welch, uh, in his cheekily entitled book, Blame It on the Brain, would also argue the same thing. He says, behavior that is more accurately called a weakness proceeds from the body and is sickness or suffering. He would argue uh, that in these instances of sickness or suffering, we may actually turn to things like medication, you know, judiciously, wisely, to alleviate that suffering. And he goes on to say, sickness or suffering can also be caused by specific sin, but we must be very careful to have ample justification before we make such a link. And I, I guess what I want to say is that within the church, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it may well be that we leap to this idea of where is the unconfessed sin, where is the sin in your life that you need to deal with, and we may actually, as a result, alienate our brothers and sisters and cut them off or shame them uh, and prevent them from receiving help that might enable them to make better use of scripture and spiritual disciplines and the support of brothers and sisters. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to another psalm, Psalm 102, 
um, for my days vanish like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. Again, similar sort of mental anguish type symptoms, but here he's not actually linking it to specific sin. And I was really interested uh, to find out, I have to thank my wife, Lindsay, for, for um, finding this graphic, but the vast majority of the Psalms, if you can see on the top uh, left-hand uh, or right-hand bubble, um, that's actually Psalms of lamentation. So the, the vast majority of the Psalms have to do with lamenting and expressing this anguish, but not all of them are associated with sin. And so even within the Bible, we can see instances where people are crying out to God in mental anguish, but it is not equated with sin. So please, when we approach individuals, let's not, let's not jump to this question of, uh, you know, where is, the, where is the unconfessed sin? And perhaps the most poignant example of that within the Bible is, is the story of Job, who of course experienced tremendous loss um, of his wealth, of his children, and finally of his own health, and his friends came to him again and again and said, you know, where's the sin? Confess the sin. Um, and he responds to them, miserable comforters are you all. Let's, let's not be miserable comforters, brothers and sisters. Um, and I leave you with this, this thought, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, and again, Jesus' response to those who questioned him was, no one. It's, in fact, so that the glory of God may be made known. And so I want to leave you with this idea um, that maybe when it comes to mental illness, it's not as uh, cut and dry as either or. Either you do all of your, you know, sort of counseling, get your biblical counseling within the church, or you're an unfaithful Christian. Or maybe it's actually both and. Why don't we see if we can get you on an antidepressant that might alleviate some of your suffering to enable you to actually make good use of biblical counsel or pastoral care or brothers and sisters sharing the word of God with you and praying alongside you. Maybe we can actually incorporate these ideas judiciously uh, within the church. What can we do as brothers and sisters? Uh, well, ultimately, I think it, it um, safety is it. Can you advance the slide to what can we do? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we can focus on safety. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if somebody's coming to you and saying that they're actually thinking about suicide, they have a concrete plan, they're about to do something, really at that point, I would be calling 911 or taking them in your car to the emergency department. Uh, there are other uh, legal avenues uh, to pursue that as well. Certainly, if anybody under the age of 16 uh, is at risk or you have caught wind of, of them being at risk of physical, mental, emotional, sexual abuse, um, were to report to the authorities. I think sometimes within the church we have this idea that we're just going to deal with it on our own, but there are structures uh, in place um, to support people. Please, 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 in the case of trauma, um, do not get into the habit of, of asking uh, the traumatized individual what was your contribution to it? Um, or, you know, let's let's help you reconcile with your rapist um, because that just is not going to be helpful. Uh, we really need to be focusing on the safety of the person who is traumatized and keeping them safe from the person who has traumatized them or the instance that traumatized them. And just more generally speaking, I think uh, Proverbs would tell us we should be slow uh, to speak and quick to listen. And I think it takes a lot of wisdom and empathy to know, to enter into suffering with people. Um, and sometimes it's hard. It's hard. We may have this desire to, um, as soon as someone one laments to to try to you know quiet them in some kind of way or uh, dismiss their suffering and I think it's hard to walk alongside people but I do believe it's what we're called uh, to do as brothers and sisters within the church so I'm going to leave it there I know there's a lot that's uh, unsaid and we'll have a lot of time for questions hopefully I just want to finish off with some acknowledgments uh, I want to say that over the past two and a half years uh, it's really been such a blessing to be under the authority and leadership of our Elders at Grace Fellowship, Don Mills, uh, Julian Nabil, and Paul. Uh, Paul is here today, but uh, they've just been such a model and example of how to, to how to lovingly and compassionately treat brothers and sisters who are suffering uh, in our midst. I also want to thank Dr. Helen No, who is uh, a marriage and family uh, therapist and also a Tyndale professor, one of my wife's professors. 
She's also married to the lead pastor here, and she was really helpful in helping me organize my thoughts in preparation for this talk. And finally, of course, I want to want to thank my beloved and beautiful wife, uh, who has heard this talk 20 odd times and each time given me uh, helpful feedback to shape it. And so this talk is as much, uh, you know, my my work as much as it is uh, hers. And last but not least, I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm going to leave you with this this verse from Revelation 21, and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for question and answers now, so the floor is open. So I know there's a, uh, a trend afoot where spiritual leaders, pastors, a lot of them are not getting involved at all and just referring people right from the first moment on to a professional. What's your perspective on that? I think uh, in true psychiatrist form, I'm going to say it depends, right? Like I think <laughs> it really, <laughs> it depends on the, uh, on the instance. I think, you know, I think we would do well as the church uh, to equip ourselves, our pastors, our, our you know, people to have a certain facility or knowledge of how to uh, give wise counsel, be it from a biblical counseling perspective or from a cognitive behavior therapy, let's say, perspective. Um, and I, I don't think we have to you know, necessarily go right off the bat to a secular psychologist or a psychiatrist um, at the same time, I, I would be more afraid of the reverse happening of, you know, kind of reverse shaming or saying, oh, you have a mental illness, it means you don't have enough faith or you don't, you're not praying enough. Um, and I, I think that's a real issue. It can really extend the stigma uh, of hurting people even within the church where I, where I feel it should be a place of compassion and we should uh, be facilitating these relationships that are healing and safe. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> Thank you. OK, thanks for a great talk. Um, Two-fold question. One is uh, um, with kids and the yeah. uh, increased use of drugs, is there any link of use of recreational drugs and depression? And yeah. then secondly, if you're parents and you have a uh, child in your family that uh, uh, seems clearly depressed, uh, yeah. showing all the signs that you yeah. The first patient uh, stops going to church, stops yeah. practicing his faith, and quite frankly doesn't want to uh, have any treatment at all. What, what advice would you have for parents? Yeah, that's, that's really tough. So as far as drugs go, I mean, uh, there's some good evidence to suggest that things like, like alcohol uh, can certainly influence depression. Uh, cannabis can certainly enhance anxiety and psychosis. Uh, so several drugs of abuse can be implicated. In fact, within the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, there are even these diagnostic categories like substance-induced, benzodiazepine-induced, alcohol-induced, depression, anxiety, mood disorder, whatever it may be. So I think the link is there. It really depends on the substance and the length of use and the degree of use, the extent of use. Obviously, there's an idea that the more that you use, the more likely you're going to have some psychological repercussions from it. As far as, um, you know, sort of people not coming to church uh, or not being able to, to get to church, I think, again, there it's like we need to understand if possible, uh, where that's coming from. Is it that there's been something that's been said uh, that has alienated this in individual, or is it that this person is just like not able to get up out of bed? In which case, I would say, maybe it's time for a medication consult and just see you know, if there might be something that could give them a bit of energy to alleviate them to the point where they could actually say, OK, you know what, I'm not 100%, but I'm going to go. I'm going to try uh, and do this. And I think. Denialism, minimization, um, you know, a wish for it to just go away, whether on account of prayer or just on account of denying it, um, it exists. It exists both within the church and without the church. Um, and I think we are fighting somewhat of an uphill battle when it comes to mental illness. It's a lot more stigmatizing to say I'm going to see a psychiatrist than it is to say I'm going to see my endocrinologist or I'm going to see my oncologist. Um, and I don't know why that would be, um, but I think as long as you're able to continue to um, express in 
uh, explicit and also implicit ways that you love this individual, that you are adamantly for them, that you care about them, um, I think that's going to be a good, a good start. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for the talk. The, the quotes you shared from Bodhi and uh, Dr. MacArthur reminded me of a recent kind of pretty provocative article by yeah. the Gospel Coalition yeah. talking about anxiety, reflecting a lack of, of trust and yeah. taking rest in the Savior. So as someone who studied this, where would you maybe hash out the line between responsibility and chemical imbalance, between actually worrying or having anxiety, laziness and depression? Is there a distinction? Yeah. Is it helpful? How do you wrestle through that? Yeah, wow, that is a really great, really great question. Um, I think Ed Welch um, talks about it a lot in Blame It on the Brain, so I'd encourage you to, to think about that. I, can, I guess the bottom line is like we never really know. Like we don't, we don't have like a lab test, like what proportion of this is uh, sin, what proportion of this is just general laziness versus like biochemical imbalance. Um, and so I think, um, the party line or my approach to it would be like, hey, look, I know that um, life is really difficult right now. Like, I can I can come alongside that. I'm going to be here and ready for you uh, no matter what. Like, Ed Welch would argue that um, a weakness or sickness cannot cause us to sin, right? So it cannot cause us to do something that wasn't already there. But in the line of anxiety, it becomes a bit harder to say because, you know, is it a sin? Is it a lack of trust in God? Um, you know, if we're experiencing anxiety. What I would say is, um, I really don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, but I would come back at it and say, uh, let's open up as many potential avenues of intervention as possible and suggest to, you know, whoever it may be that you're related with that they seek some counsel that they seek, maybe even some medications or a consult, and see if there might be avenues there that they could shore up. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, if there really is that kind of laziness or, or anxiety that persists, um, then to deal with that uh, with the appropriate means, be it through pastoral ministry or other sorts of avenues. That's a sort of a cop-out answer, but it's it's one of these these issues with psychiatry and mental illness because it's like it's so gray, right? And that's why like my colleagues in radiology or in like you know in orthopedic surgery really want that finite answer. That's like this is how it is, and and in psychiatry, um, it's just it's hard to to really make that kind of call. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And John, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, one of the, I guess I'm asking a question about the relationship, since this is a conference about worldviews, the relationship between your worldview and your risk of mental illness. And I was just wondering if you could comment on the notion that possibly having religious faith builds in resilience mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to cope with the kinds of insults that would put you at risk yeah. for mental illness otherwise. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really great question, something that I've thought about. Um, a lot. I, I can't comment on specific literature, but just thinking from a biopsychosocial kind of model, because we don't only think in this way when we're thinking about origins of mental illness, we also think in this way when we're thinking about how to treat or how to intervene, um, whether we're dealing with someone within the church or without. Um, and so it would make, it would stand to reason that somebody who is actually connected uh, with a group of non judgmental, uh, accepting, supportive individuals who are for them, uh, they're probably going to be in a better position than somebody who is just a lone wolf, uh, you know, who's divorced him or herself from the rest of society or family members. And so I think within the church, we have so many avenues of potential um, support, right, in, informal support, um, and even skilled support in the form of pastors that we can avail ourselves to. And I would imagine uh, implicitly, though I don't have the evidence or the numbers to back it up, uh, that there might actually be something there that people are who are well connected and integrated, who have strong supportive relationships, are going to be able to weather the vicissitudes of life in a way that those who are disconnected would not be. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are as a psychiatrist in terms of psychiatric drugs as well as their side effects and whether it's wise for us as Christians to um, like to what degree should we be recommending um, psychiatric drugs to our brothers and sisters when we don't fully know 
perhaps the full implications of such drugs yet? Well, I think that's a, uh, that's a great question and not to get too, too cheeky in my response, but I would say that um, it's hard to say across the board. Certainly there are risks and benefits to any medication, to any medical intervention, uh, whether it's psychiatric or endocrinological or you know physical, whatever it may be. Uh, and so I think ultimately, um, as brothers and sisters, uh, I think the best thing that we can do is to support our brothers and sisters in uh, educating themselves, in going to their psychiatrist, going to their physician, and talking about the risks and benefits. I think where we can get into trouble is where we actually have very strong views about medication. And I see this outside of the church as well. I work in child psychiatry, so I have parents who are adamant that their son or daughter is never going to be on an antipsychotic or antidepressant medication. And I think in those instances, I really think it bodes well for the suffering individual if you if you refrain from making a call, because that is a medical call, ultimately, whether the risks would uh, be outweighed by the benefits. Um, and so what I would say is, broadly speaking, without knowing any specifics about any specific class of medications, I, I generally, I do use antidepressants a lot. Do they cure the illness? Uh, in some people, they can affect a really remarkable change over the course of weeks. Uh, in most people, it's used in combination with psychotherapy, and so there is additional stuff that goes on. It's not the be-all and end-all, um, and it really varies depending on the class of medication and the type. So. Um, I guess what I could say is that I come from a mentality that um, medical interventions, science, knowledge uh, has really been given to us by God, like our ability to observe nature and to study and to infer nature. Um, and medications could be a tremendous means of grace to someone who is suffering. And we needn't sort of um, heap up their suffering by saying, Oh, you know, you really shouldn't be thinking about medication because it means that you're not, you don't have enough faith. Really, you should be praying more. Um, does that answer your question? Which, if you have a follow-up question, like I'd love to, I'd love to. Does it? Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Thank you for the talk. You're um, my question is. Um, uh, for us as Christians, is there a difference between depression and, or what we term as spiritual low? Or, and um, in that case, or rather, are they intricately tied together, like as Christians? Mm -hmm. And um, in the case where we d determine if it's one or the other, mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to approach um, in terms of helping someone? Mm -hmm. And sorry, there's a third part. Um, and in the case of repetitive occurrence, of such a state, mm -hmm, like what's, mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> these are doozies. Um, I think, <laughs> I think you know, as far as spiritual lows go, um, I guess I would I would need to know what your your um, your I guess your thoughts or definition about that would be. I mean, certainly we can see instances of lament. I mean, that was kind of like what what I was going at with the Psalms, right? Instances where people are crying out and they're really experiencing these periods of dryness for a sense of distance from God. Is it the same as major depressive disorder? I don't know. I could certainly suggest that one may influence the other, right? Like I think if you're experiencing major depression, which by def definition is two weeks of low mood or anhedonia, meaning lack of pre um, pleasure in life, low energy, poor sleep, change in appetite, poor concentration, suicidal thoughts, um, and uh, lowered self-esteem, guilt. like. Of course, that may color you know, your relationship with God. You may start to see um, the word of God, or you may start to see your relationships with brothers and sisters in the church through that kind of depressogenic lens, right? And so do they interact? Yes, definitely. How can we tease them apart? I'm not really sure. Um, but in, on the surface of it, it would seem that if it was purely, if there could be such a thing, purely a spiritual depression, probably you would bode well to approach your pastor, your elders, um, and really seek uh, mentorship, accountability within the church body. And if it was purely uh, you know, a medical psychiatry, like kind of depression, then maybe medications and psychotherapy could be helpful. But again, I'm, I'm of the, the mentality, and it may sound somewhat synchro synchrotic, I don't know what the actual adjective would be, but um, 
it, I'm of the mentality that both and is, is probably the best way to go, like approaching things in a both and kind of way and not trying to cut things or parcelate them out into this is good, this is bad, this is the church, this is not kind of thing. All right, yeah. we have t time for just two more very brief questions and answers. Okay. Um, so we ha already have those two people selected. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious, um, as a practicing Christian yeah. who is working um, in a secular environment, yeah. Um, I think when we are amongst brothers and sisters in a church environment, I think mm. when someone has a difficult situation and dealing with anxiety or depression per se, like I think we have the hope in Christ that we yeah. can talk about and yeah. we can, um, we have the word that we can share. Um, but I'm wondering in your practice then when you're talking with people that don't share that worldview and the yeah. faith, how does how do you practice as a helping professional from a Christian perspective? Yeah, that's a great, great uh, question. Um, so I, I will say, I'll start out by saying in my my nine to five job, like I don't I don't right, I don't share the gospel. It's we're not allowed to for lack of a better um, description of it. Um, but how do I practice as a Christian in that context? I pray. Um, every person that I see, uh, I'm praying for them in anticipation of the next time I'm praying for them. I'm intimately acquainted with some of the struggles, the specific struggles and stressors that they're experiencing. And I pray. I, I tell God, you know, I remember this person, remember this situation, remember the experience and the anguish that they're experiencing, and I pray for them. And God has actually been very faithful in answering those prayers and I can think of several specific instances where he's actually brought people miraculously, it would seem, to, to the church or to the body um, after these prayers. And so that's my kind of subversive, and I have to be careful because I'm, you know, I'm being recorded right now, <laughs> kind of uh, approach to, to practicing as a Christian in a secular context. Um, to some extent, it's like, you know, it's a special context, it's mental health, but in the same way, I would also put the question back to all of us, you know, how do we live um, as salt and the light, and salt and light in a world that does not know God, you know, in our actions, in our behaviors, uh, in our words, do we communicate that we, we value this person as a human um, apart from their achievements, apart from, you know, their earthly successes and their status? Do we recognize and treat them as someone who is made in the image of God. Um, and I think that's how I would approach, approach it. Yeah. Two okay. minutes. Sorry. Hi, thanks for the talk, You're Jonathan. Yeah. Um, my question is a bit related to that one in okay. terms of the secular world. Um, I have a good friend of mine who uh, is not a Christian and mm -hmm. she has a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, I really struggle with sharing the gospel with her because yeah. A lot of times she shares her anxieties with me and she does have an anxiety disorder. Yeah. And so it's just, um, I think sometimes when I bring that up, I think she, it seems that she might, it, it, it's like to her, it's like I'm not taking into account that yeah. she has that and I don't yeah. know how to share the gospel. And I, I don't know if me telling her that she's a sinner, she might equate it to, um, her anxiety, so mm -hmm. I, I don't really know how to go about there. I think it takes, this is a great question, and I'm really encouraged by your heart and your wrestle uh, with that question, because I can tell you obviously care about your friend and you want to communicate the gospel. I would say in that kind of instance, um, you do well to build some relational equity by really listening uh, and empathically reflecting back what you hear. So if someone is saying to you, you know, I'm really seriously uh, anxious right now, I can't handle this, and immediately you say, well, you know, cast your cares on the Lord and he cares for you, then that probably isn't showing or demonstrating that you've actually acutely heard or received what she said. So if you say to her, you know, I notice that you're really anxious, you know, tell me a bit about that. And like over the course of several times of your meeting and your friendship, really show that you care um, before you speak show that you are able to sit there with her and, and shoulder her anguish um, by your listening and your reflecting back. You know, I, I can see you're really, you're tormented by this. I can see 
this is really difficult for you. And then pray for those opportune moments, and the Spirit will work in those ways. It'll really reveal to you those times where you can maybe have those gospel bites, right, and, and share the God. I hope that helps. It, it feels like uh, it's a murky kind of statement, but really looking to build up that equity that you have, that relational equity with your friends in the way that you listen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jonathan.